I promise not to bang the, uh, okay, we're feeding back, so I'll turn this on. I promise not to bang the uh, gong here. Uh, let, I'll let Donald uh, do that. I want to thank the uh, Committee on 100 and Donald uh, Tang for uh, organizing this session and Citigroup for its sponsorship and inviting me here. I only have five minutes. I actually brought some uh, slides, uh, and I think uh, I'll, I'll go through those uh, as well. I'd like to begin by providing some context. Even in five minutes, I think context uh, is important. Uh, and then show you some slides and discuss the sort of where we are with sovereign wealth funds right now, talk about some projections about uh, investment and, and, and growth of their assets, and then talk about some of the implications of this, and of course, look forward to the question and answer. The first thing I'd like to say is even let's step back from the sovereign wealth fund uh, discussion. There's a lot of talk in the last five or six years about imbalances, and they are truly global imbalances. In the U.S., we tend to focus on the current account deficit, but uh, the current account deficit in the U.S. is the mirror image of current account surpluses in the rest of the world. Uh, and as the chart makes clear, and I think you'll have it in your pack, even though there's a lot of focus on China, in fact, in recent years, the biggest increase in surpluses globally have not been in China. They have been uh, in the Middle East because of the high uh, oil prices. And so uh, the U.S. deficit in, in very important part, and I've written about this both as a, a Treasury official and since leaving the Treasury, is the way I think of it is it's really part of a global equilibrium. And an important part of the equilibrating uh, adjustment in the last five or six years has been a widening deficit that absorbed uh, the surpluses in the rest of the world. But certainly it's a global issue. It's not certainly just a U.S.-China uh, issue, which is what you might think uh, from some of the recent commentary. A second point I'd like to make is that we live in a world of incredible financial globalization. This is a chart that depicts the gross holdings of U.S. assets by foreign investors. That's the yellow line on top. And below that is the gross U.S. holdings of foreign assets abroad. And what's striking about that chart is the sort of hockey stick takeoff that you see in the last 10 years with gross holdings, gross foreign holdings of U.S. assets tripling in the last uh, 10 years or so. And and more or less the same in terms of U.S. holdings of foreign assets. Now, this is not just a blip. I think this is part uh, of really what we will see for the next century, which is an incredible increase in financial globalization. The difference between the two lines uh, is what is called the net international investment position uh, of the U.S. Uh, and that has been more or less stable in the past six or seven years. And that's another striking uh, fact. Uh, that owes in part to uh, changes in, in international valuations and other factors, which I won't have time to discuss, but I've written about in other uh, contexts. And so let's now turn to sovereign wealth funds. This is the sort of standard numbers that you uh, see uh, that the, the way sovereign wealth funds are currently uh, defined, they control about $3 trillion uh, worth of assets. And indeed, that's you know substantial a number, as, as Rob uh, mentioned. This excludes, for the most part, uh, assets that are under the control of central bank uh, reserves. This is just a list. Uh, there won't be a quiz afterwards, but this is just a list of the top uh, 35, and there's quite a range uh, in terms of the size of these institutions, in terms of the number of years they've been investing, in terms of their style of investing. So certainly one thing I'd like you to come away from today, and I think you will, uh, is that it's really, not, uh, it's really not appropriate to paint with a broad brush or put all of these investors into one category. You really have a number of different styles, enough for different approaches to investing. We have an audience here uh, largely from Asia, so I thought I'd put up a slide. Uh, uh, in Asia, a lot of, there's been a lot of attention about sovereign wealth funds uh, around the world, including in Asia, and the size of those assets are in blue, but the, the bars that are in gold for each country are the central bank uh, reserves. And you'll see in most of the Asian countries, uh, most of the officially controlled assets are not, are not in sovereign wealth funds. They're uh, in the central bank uh, reserve management. Uh, here's my attempt to put this $3 trillion uh, in context. Uh, $3 trillion is a lot of money. Uh, a lot of these institutions, Norway is a counterexample, but a lot of institutions don't provide detailed reporting. These are some estimates from Bank of America in a recent study that they published publicly uh, available. And they estimate that roughly speaking, uh, this, uh, this $3 trillion of sovereign wealth fund assets is split roughly uh, 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 $1.6 trillion in bonds, 
uh, 1.2 trillion in equity and 200 billion uh, in uh, alternatives. Um, interestingly enough, as a percent of, of GDP right now, a global GDP, that's about uh, 6%. It's about 5% of global market cap of equity values and only about 1.5% of global financial uh, assets. Uh, so a couple of points from the slide. One, by all estimates, it looks like these investments are, um, are relatively traditionally managed uh, uh, right now and a relatively small share of market cap or GDP. Um, where are these trends going? This is a chart which, let me, Get up. This is a chart which is an estimate of where the, the growth rate, and I focused here on the Asian reserves, and obviously in Asia you don't have a lot of oil exports, but even given the growth and the dynamism of the region, there'll be a substantial increase in the assets. Uh, these are different scenarios that I've seen. Again, this is one uh, from, from uh, a B of A. We take our $3 trillion sovereign wealth fund assets now and we ask, where will this be? And uh, they pick the year 20. Uh, 15, and I think the estimates that were given in the previous talk are similar. Under a conservative scenario, these assets could double, uh, and under a more aggressive scenario, they could triple in the next uh, eight, eight years. And obviously, this will have a con consequence in the global uh, financial market. Again, we're talking not only about the size, but just the growth in these assets will be several trillion uh, dollars. Um, but it's also important to point out, as this slide does, that while the numerator uh, is, is huge, the denominator is even more huge. So let's look at, for example, the conservative scenario, uh, scenario one here, where sovereign wealth fund assets roughly double to six trillion by 2015. That'll move up to 7% of world GDP, 6% uh, of world market cap, and 2% of, of global financial uh, assets. Even under the very aggressive scenario of a tripling in sovereign wealth fund assets, there's still only about 10% of market cap or 3% of GDP. So this is really getting at the point in my, my second slide, which is that sovereign wealth funds are a part of financial globalization. They're an important part, uh, but they are not the entire story of, of financial globalization. Indeed, under these scenarios, their share of financial globalization will still remain uh, uh, modest. I think there are a couple of important implications of this. Uh, one uh, is that while the U.S. dollars, and I bring this up because my, my friend who I used to work with at the Treasury I knew would not say anything about the dollar, but I can. Uh, I think one trend is that while the dollar is still the global uh, reserve uh, currency, uh, that trend uh, is down. I think the dollar will likely remain the global reserve currency for some time. Again, I only have five minutes. Uh, I've written about this. It's available up on PEMCO.com and other sources if you want to read it. Uh, and we do see from this chart that the share of dollars in global reserves uh, has started to decline. But, but I think that process will be gradual, not abrupt. Uh, but I do think the dollar downdraft in terms of its foreign exchange value uh, will, uh, will continue, part because of global reserve diversification, part just because of the fact that a, big, a larger and larger share of global growth now is outside of the of the U.S. As I say in the slide, you know, the U.S. has gone from being an engine of global growth to being the caboose uh, for global uh, growth. Now that's really where we are in the cycle, but I think even longer term we will see a downtrend uh, in, the, in the dollar in part for these factors. So let me conclude uh, on that and look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much.